This is Stanley Moy from the AAAS meeting in Washington, D.C. Jeremy is a professor of biological chemistry at Imperial College in London, and he's an expert in metabolomics. Jer Jeremy, a lot of people know what genomics is and metagenomics and a lot of these things. I think our understanding of what metabolomics in is, is, is a lot less clear. Could you say what, what you do? Sure. Uh, well, metabolic profiling, metabolomics, metabolomics, they're all related themes. Uh, it's to do with uh, capturing as much biochemical small molecule information from a biological sample and building a mathematical model of it so you can classify the sample as to normal, abnormal or what have you. So you use advanced technologies like mass spectrometry and uh, NMR spectroscopy for measuring hundreds or thousands of metabolites at a time and then trying to crystallize that down using a mathematical model into something that's easy for a human to understand. So you started off looking at the human metabolome and now you've transitioned into looking at microbes. How did that happen? Well, purely by chance really. Uh, so we've been spending years developing technologies and tools for uh, trying to identify what molecules are what and what they're doing and the patterns of them associated with different diseases. And we were running toxicological models in animals, we were running effects of drug treatments, we were looking at clinical diagnostics for different diseases, gut diseases, liver diseases. And one of the things that came up repeatedly was gut microbial metabolites as being part of the diagnostic pattern. Uh, associated with a particular classification of a disease or a toxic process. And originally it used to really annoy me because I said, oh, that damn bugs get in the way of the biochemistry. And then it, uh, eventually, it was probably about 10 years ago, a, a little light went on in my head and said, oh, that's part of an actual integrated pattern of response because the microbes are symbiotic. They're ch exchanging metabolic information and communicating with us and they're responding to all of these different stressors on the human body. One of the really striking examples that surprised me when I first heard it is your discovery about acetaminophen and the role of microbes in toxicity of acetaminophen. Can you tell us what that's well, it's about? It's not so much as the, as the toxicity as the metabolism of acetaminophen or Tylenol as it's more you know, widely known in America. Um, and metabolism of course is uh, the drug is linked to toxicity so you can make that sort of connection. But we were working on a, um, something called pharmacometabonomics, right? So pharmacometabonomics is taking a profile, a metabolic profile of a sample from an individual and then trying to predict the future based on that metabolic profile. And you do that by building a mathematical model that relates what's the starting position to what the end point is. So we proved that in rats for drug toxicity a number of years ago, published a paper in Nature. And then we wanted to do an experiment in humans, right? And you can't poison humans, so you can't do toxicological experiments. You can do drug metabolism experiments though. So it shows the simplest drug, really widely known, thousands of publications on it. Everything's supposed to be known about its metabolism. Tylenol, two tablets, take the urine sample from somebody before and look at the metabolism, main metabolic fate afterwards. And what we found, actually to my surprise, was it was gut microbial metabolites that were determining the proportions of metabolites of the Tylenol. And we figured out very quickly that one of the metabolites that's made by um, the clostridia in the lower gut, uh, paracresol, which is something you put in creosote, you know, protects fences, right, um, against rotting, uh, is actually a sulfate demander. And people who make a lot of it in their gut just can't sulfate Tylenol properly, and they become weak sulfators, therefore changing the metabolic pattern associated with, you know, that drug. And that has never been discovered before. It's actually a major effect on trilonyl metabolism was caused by gut microbes by a simple production of uh, cresol from putrefaction of protein. Extraordinary. It, well, and so recently, metabolic pathways like that, you have some starting evidence that they probably play a key role in things we would never have suspected, like autoimmune disease and, and even a variety of psychiatric diseases Oh, as yeah, well. sure. I mean, just... Uh, just finishing off on the paracetamol, sorry, acetaminophen thing, is that in fact the thing that we discovered was relevant to all drugs that required sulfation. So it's actually much broader than just paracetamol. And it's hundreds of different drugs are affected by gut microbial activity. This is one of the reasons why pharmacogenomics doesn't work terribly well, because it only looks at the human genome, it doesn't look at the microbial ones and what's going on. But yeah, absolutely, there are relationships between gut microbial functional activity and a whole range of different uh, diseases. And we've linked in microbial metabolite variation to variation in human BMI, uh, 
uh, body mass index to blood pressure. Uh, there are abnormalities in neuropsychiatric disorders like autism. The list goes on and on. There's almost every sort of disease, one way or another, has some connection somewhere to the microbes. It's quite extraordinary. I mean, this has huge implications for thinking about personalized medicine. There are still yeah. so many people who are saying, if you give me your genome, I will give you the treatment. But uh, your studies... Well, I put it to you that that's nonsense, right? I mean, it, it's, we all know, right, that most people in the world die of environmental causes. About 98% of the world die. Very few people actually die of genetic causes. Doesn't mean to say there aren't genetic influences on disease, but you're only playing with a fraction of the pack. If, if you look at the number of microbial genes in the body, estimate now 3.3 million, 23,000 human genes, that makes us 0.7% human. So if you're only playing with the human genomes, you far short of the full pack of all the genetically active material in the body. And that's why understanding microbial activity and its metabolic interactions in the host is critical to be able to understand not only the etiopathogenesis of many diseases, but also the actual optimized therapy for many, many diseases. So if you take that to the extreme, you say, okay, if you want to be able to make predictions about what's going on, you need to know about what's going on in the microbiome as well as what's going on in the individual. Yeah. Um, there's a, a tremendous amount of information that's required. How far out do you think it will be before these kinds of approaches will be practical on an individual medicine scale? Well, we're trying to use it in individualized medicine already. Uh, I, I had a, you know, a surgical surgery and cancer department, so we're very interested in practical implementation of these technologies and approaches, and indeed microbial signatures. So for instance, you know, if you're talking about somebody who's undergoing gut surgery, at the end of the surgery, you can get sepsis due to bacterial translocation, septicemia, and die. Now, that is related partly to the microbial activity and microbes that are present in the microbiome. So if we could get a metabolic profile that indicates certain sorts of microbial metabolic activity that is most likely to be associated with a post-surgical problem, then you have a way of stratifying patients, maybe treating them with different antibiotics or probiotics even prior to going into third surgery. We're actually doing this now and trying to you know, stratify patients for better health care. And, and the other thing is, when people talk about individualized medicine, um, they often think that you have to have an exact mathematical model that describes you. That's almost impossible because there are too many variables. Right? What you need to do is have stratification, right? So this treatment is likely to be good for you, do nothing for you or be bad for you. That's if you, if you reduce it down in that way, it's much easier. But the important part of whether something's like to be good or bad for you, whether it's drugs or surgery or in you know, nutritional, uh, actually is partly in the bugs. Right? There you go. Very exciting time. Thank okay. you very much, Jeremy.